Hello and welcome. Welcome to Investing in Tongue and Tech, exploring the language industry potential. Um, we will dive into the exciting world of investing in the language industry today. Today we have a dynamic trio with us. Marcus Sagerman, senior member of the investment team at Mayfair Equity Department. Our own Laszlo Varga, NIMSE consultant and expert in language technology. And myself, Angelica Bonilla, part of NIMSE's growth team and your host today. Hello, hello Marcos, hello Laszlo, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing Lovely Marcos, to be here. Marcos, thank you so much to be here. It's excellent to have you on NIMSI. Before starting and going into the topic, I would like to ask you to please briefly explain a little bit to us who are you and what Mayfair Equity Partners core business is. Hi, Angelica. Of course, more than happy to. Delighted to be here and uh, thank you for having me on, on your show. So we're very, very briefly, uh, Mayfair Equity yeah. Partners um, is a mid-market private equity firm located in London. Um, we focus on finding and backing really the best management teams in the TMT, tech, media, telecom and consumer industries um, in the UK and very much beyond it as well. My role as a manager director at Mayfair is then to find new opportunities, investment opportunities, build relationships with the management teams, evaluate the investment, and ultimately um, to well, strike a deal um, with that with that investment and back the management team for the next um, three to five years, typically. Um, so whilst we are not thematic in the sense that we don't look for a particular niche and market segment that we invest in, um, I have somehow ended up spending a lot of time in and around the language services space, which has ultimately led uh, to an investment in this space, which I guess we'll be talking about today a little more. Of course we are. Thank you, Marcus. And Laszlo, you are a known face here, of course, with our latest events in, on AI and tech. But for the newcomers, tell us a little bit about yourself and your work at NIMSI. Yeah, thank you, Angelica. I'm, I'm also thrilled to be here with Marcus. And um, we've been working together on well, some parts of at least of, of Mayfair's investment in the language technology um, and language services industry. But I also work um, on other typically client commission projects. Um, and would those be audits? Would those be business process improvement um, or um, any kind of audit and, and consultancy, both for language service providers and uh, language services buyers as well? And of course, I also participate in, in various research initiatives here at NIMSI Insights. Um, including, of course, the big disruption of our age. Well, the second big one, probably, of our age um, after um, Google Translation and Machine Translation, uh, which is large language models and all the language AI underneath and, and behind it. Um, so also coming from that research, there are plenty of insights that we're probably going to touch on uh, today. But I think more importantly, we're going to be talking about the project where we actually got to work together with Marcus and the Mayfair so, team. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. And Marcos, I will start talking about a little yeah, bit be... about the investment context. We started this year with yeah. a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. People were I worried think, about inflation, is, right, right, interest know. rates, right. hikes, and a slow economic <laughs> dynamic. And we had this. Um, and we, we, we have this feeling that investors have been taking a pass and that the, the market is not moving a lot. I would like to ask you a little bit about how, what do you think about the context and what's going on on the investor side? Very good question, Angelica. And uh, you already mentioned a good number of the relevant factors. So there's a lot going on. And, as you as you rightly put it, that leads to very little going on on the investment context. Um, I think times are indeed incredibly uncertain. Within 18 months, we went from through COVID, still the longest um, bull run almost in at least my living memory, and uh, and we had the tech sell off. We had the beginning of the Ukraine war, inflation, as you said, interest rate hikes. All right, hikes and and the stalling global economy, um, they all sort of played our part to make our life investors our life investors more difficult and more importantly make the future less predictable. 
um, that makes investment decisions more risky. And if you then rely on yeah. debt and equity financing, um, also makes them more costly as uh, more risk requires higher higher returns also for the debt uh, for the lenders. Um, that requires lower entry valuations for investments to still make sense, in particular if you can't look into a um, growing future as much as you did before. Um, combine that then with sellers being used to getting really good prices for their assets, um, and you get to a point where just much fewer deals get done because sellers' expectations and uh, buyers' requirements um, really aren't met. Um, it's not quite as black and white, um, but it, it does mean that it is true that uh, crafting a deal has become a lot more difficult and that investors have become a lot more selective um, when and where to deploy, deploy their capital. Hence, you are right, there is a bit of a pause in the market. Thank, thank you. Uh, yes, I have had that feeling that investors have been way more in going in depth into the company before investing, and actually, and they're looking for better profitability expectations and um, more a, a solid ground to, before investing into a company. Having said that. Um, of course, there, we are going through these two scenarios. On one side, there's uncertainty on the economical side, but on the other side, we have been going through this new gold rush that is happening around AI. It seems that if you're looking to invest or looking for investors, you need to have these two letters in your proposal or in your company to be appealing. Marcus, how true do you think this is? What's going on with it at AI from the investor side? It's a very good point, and it is exactly the opposite of almost what I just said, because everything that has AI in its name, and that is objectively very true, is just very likely to find, or much more likely to find good investment. You've got um, Microsoft's investment in OpenAI, which is a few weeks old, um, but by far not the only one in the space. Right. You just had Mistral raising 100 so odd million at a 240 million valuation for a company that was four weeks old and nothing more than just an idea. A few founders that knew the space waved their arms and uh, got a bunch of money. So that sounds very much like a gold rush um, to me. Potentially even rightly so, because in the end, the opportunity in the space is is quite is quite vast. Um, we are a little less focused on venture bets at Mayfair, um, but we are, however, also thinking about how AI can evolve to impact the markets that our investments are in, and equally importantly, how we can leverage AI to be more productive and to compete better. So as and when we explore um, an investment and really understand it, as you were saying, in detail and in depth, AI also plays a part uh, in that evaluation for us. That is very interesting. Yes, I have seen that a lot of new companies are yeah, being formed, yeah, yeah. especially by a lot of people that were laid off after the tech crunch, let's call it, and they're creating their own companies and they're, they seem to be the only ones that are getting a lot of investment. Yeah, ball, so we ball, have yeah. these two we, we, we dynamics two going on at the moment that are kind of contradictive, ball, yeah. but are going at the same time. Let's look, yeah, what I do you think it, about I this? Think. Is this completely new or this is just another step into tech evolution? I think it's, uh, I think it's a name. Well, uh, to be honest, it's, it's both very new and very old. I mean, Artificial intelligence has been in the language industry for a number of years. Well, we kind of count it from the time when Google released um, neural machine translation in Google Translate, right? Um, but in reality, Google Translate is and, and all the aid that came afterwards with neural machine translation and some other machine learning models, they were pretty, um, well, they're narrow focus, they're purpose built. Whereas with, you know, with the, the next generation of AI, all these large language models, they essentially offer a platform to do a whole bunch of things. They're general purpose machines and they're very easy to get started with. Um, but Marcus said something very in important there, which is it's all about essentially, uh, does it provide something along the size of productivity or does it provide a competitive edge? 
when it comes to language service providers, those are essentially the two key questions to ask. Because let's face it, the fact that it's easy to start with large language models also kind of means that it's rather easy to copy whatever you create with them. Um, it is possible to add proprietary um, information, even build IP on it, of course. Um, then again, it's very likely that somebody will come along and build something better, faster, um, cheaper along the way, especially because, well, the technology development is really very fast. And Marcus, you mentioned um, Microsoft investing into OpenAI. Sure, um, if there's a lot of things that coming that are coming out from Microsoft's kitchen, right? Um, even just now, um, they announced that um, they are also releasing uh, the Azure. Um, how do they call it? AOAI um, functionality, so that essentially anybody can build on OpenAI's models and use their own data um, to actually. Um, work with these models uh, without having to fine tune them or retrain them, which sounds very nice. And Google is kind of probably doing similar. And we know that Amazon also on their bedrock platform, they're offering different large language models, not developing their own. So big tech definitely have a big um, foot in this. And then there's a whole range of open source sol solutions out there, which is incredibly hard to keep track of, to be very honest with you. Um, the development is really so rapid that it's kind of hard to see what the return on investment will be. I mean, ultimately, these services are not exactly cheap, at least not now. And sure, uh, you will find that you know, the, the new AI providers into their roadmap, they insert, they want to increase, um, or sorry, decrease um, uh, speed, uh, sorry, increase speed <laughs> and um, um, decrease latency. But they also want to actually make their services cheaper. So essentially what we see is big tech competing with each other, providing kind of similar platforms and services. It is a platformization of um, AI, which what we see right in front of our eyes in the past couple of months, maybe, maybe even less. Um, but what it comes out of it is that almost everybody's trying to build something. Everybody's jumping on it who has a little technology expertise. Anybody who has a Python capable engineer, um, and they have the capacity to work with these tools, they go ahead and, and do something with it, trying to find out what the clients may want. They're trying to create a little tool that uh, may actually catch some traction on the market, maybe catch the attention of an investor uh, for the future, right? And um, let's face it, language technology, uh, the big disruptions came from outside the industry um, historically. Right. Internet was not develop, uh, um, developed by the language industry. Machine translation wasn't developed by the language services industry as such. Large language models also not. We do see that um, the language industry is actually an early adopter of AI and large language models. And we have seen that there are various technology providers that build these um, tools into their offerings, either simple vanilla integrations or something a little bit more complex. Um, and we can also expect that, well, technology is just one part of the equation when it comes to the language services industry. So ultimately, we will have to see, and very soon is coming, that the services will follow suit. So there will be additional services, additional skills, additional talent um, that the language services industry will need to herd together and offer to their clients. Would that be multilingual content generation um, and how to edit, post edit the AI generated content um, so that you know you don't need to, you know, there's no longer an English source or whatever the source language may be that needs to be translated and then translated and adjusted and, and adapted. But let's do it right out of the box. Um, use multilingual content generation, essentially transcreation in, in a sense. That's one of the ways that this could be uh, disruptive to the industry. But um, the big question, of course, is. Now that we're, at least the feeling that we have and the conversations that we've been having in the industry, it seems like the hype um, on the hype curve, we're already slightly probably after the peak. And now people are really starting to work with it and try to find out what is it that can really be done and put into operations. And we know there are a whole lot of caveats, right? Anything from privacy, data protection, hallucinations, bias. Those are unsolved issues at this point of time. And if you look at them, even if you want to use a large language model for translation, they're somewhat unpredictable. It, it all comes down with experimenting with it. And it's not as clear cut as a technology that has been used for 67 years, um, neural machine translation. So we'll see which are the key use cases that will be really useful um, and uh, client will want to buy into. Uh, then again, of course, if 
you know, you're an LSP and you're looking for investors for new clients. Yeah, those two letters AI will shine very brightly um, on your on your resume. Um, many companies are already doing this, um, technology providers and language services providers too. Uh, we'll see how much of the business will actually be impacted in the sense of how many dollars will be uh, spent on investing into these technologies as well as is there new revenue coming? Because what we have seen from neural machine translation is with all the fears and doubts uh, when it came out, who is going to um, make translation translators um, obsolete? It will make the language industry obsolete. That didn't come to happen. Actually, the industry is growing pretty solidly. I guess, Marcos, that's one of the reasons why you're investing into the language services industry. And it is the services that actually um, the buyers buy. It's not the technology as such, though it may be a big component to productivity. And so the key notion here is, yep, there's a new generation of AI. There's a new generation of large language models. They may be great tools. We're just about to find out, and it's a fantastic era to be in. Fantastic. Thank you, Laszlo. This also is important because we're seeing that at the moment, we we have to identify what is actual value, where the actual gold is, and what is false gold. And you said it before, we're past the peak. At the moment, people are assessing better what AI actually can do in the company, how they can bring revenue, if there's revenue and value, and how. what are these use cases? Because everyone is talking about it, but not everyone knows what to do with it and how, and actually make it, uh, use it as, uh, where it is as a co-pilot for your job, or actually do increase your revenue in your company or just just playing around with something that you don't know what to do with and if i can add one more thought i mean even i mean google translate has been around for many years and just because it can translate it doesn't mean that it actually has economic value for a language services buyer somebody who actually is going to market with their products or services for example to international markets just because Google Translate can do the translation, it doesn't mean that it, that people are willing to pay for it because it has all the all the known, probably better understood risks attached to it. And it's kind of the same with large language models um, and AI. Just because you can do stuff with it, it doesn't mean that there is actual value generated for your clients or your future clients. That remains to be seen. And that's the kind of the exciting part of the equation. Where are we and is this going to happen? How fast? It, it is happening, I think. Uh, yeah, it is happening. Fast. And it's going to happen fast, if I may so, say so, because we have seen it. Like, this started, like the big wave started a few months ago, like beginning, ending, yeah, wow. beginning, end of 2022, beginning 2023. And we're seeing that everyone is talking about it and everyone wants to include it. So it's going to be uh, also as a race to find where the value is and what is actually going to be left behind. But we're talking here about languages and I'm going to go with Marcos with a question that we like to ask everyone that comes to talk to Nimsi. How many languages do you speak in that, Marcos? You're on mute. Um, three. Um, I've recently gotten pretty far actually with the French accent in my Spanish in Paris. So let's maybe call it three and a quarter. That is fantastic. I also have gotten really far with my Colombian accent in my uh, speaking French. So we also speak three and a little bit. Spanish, uh, Portuguese and English. But I also tend to get pretty far with my French with a very strong Colombian accent. I guess and I'm the only one who doesn't speak Spanish here on this call because Tucker is also pretty good with all Spanish. Tucker. Yeah, yeah. Every uh, there's a lot of people that here in Nimsi we speak Spanish. Is one of well, what I really love about Spanish is that allows you to travel from Mexico to Argentina with one language. You cannot do that in Europe. If you want to travel around Europe, you need to have a few languages on your pocket. Off, in but that's, Latin why, America? that's why you need companies like Yonkers. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> and talking about Yonkers, thank you so much, Laszlo. Last March, it was announced the investment from Mayfair in Yonkers. Yonkers is a tech-based 
language provider. This recent investment in the language in the, in the language industry has sparked considerable interest. Marcus, could you, could you share you with us your insights on why did you choose this sector? Yeah. More than happy to, of course. Um, and there's a multitude of elements that really makes the that really make the the investment in the language services space um, super fascinating and uh, an exciting place to be active in. And Lovell already outlined um, some of those. But let, let me actually boil it down to three or four key points that were really re really important to us. Um, I think for starters, uh, the industry has a 20 plus track record, um, 20 plus year track record of growing and not actually of growing revenues, but also of, gro uh, of a growing profit pool. Um, it's widely reported that uh, top line revenue levels have been growing at 6 to 8% per year, which is actually um, reasonably impressive um, given how long the industry has been around and still, whilst maturing, hasn't quite um, dropped back to sort of GDP ish levels. Um, Equally importantly, though, and that, that speaks to how resilient the industry is to this entire technology disruption that has come in the guise of email, translation, memory, um, neuro machine translation, stochastic machine translation before that. And none of that has really impacted the, the gross margins. So in the end, the value adds that the language service providers um, bring to the market. And that is also incredibly relevant and important to us because that long track record actually makes gives us the comfort that this is likely to continue going forward and that um, essentially the incumbents in the industry in a very fragmented market are best placed to really leverage the next technology and drive efficiencies drive market growth but at the same time um, maintain and protect the, the profit pool that they are um, commanding and growing um, so very in, a very attractive industry fundamentals on one um, on one side second I think the company that we found to invest in Yonkers um, we thought was quite special it was uh, small but already very distinctly global um, it came all it also came with a particular technology that uh, together with love we found was actually truly differentiated and um, really give, gives Yonkers an edge in its core market. Um, that at the same time also made the investment a great platform already being global having a strong technology um, but actually being quite a virtual and nimble organization at the same time uh, made it a great platform uh, for further investment in a very very fragmented market which we, uh, which is where I think many of the tech-enabled players will be benefiting from that shift to, to an importance of technology and where many of the sort of potentially smaller and more traditional players will need to think about where, where they, their way forward really lies. And um, a consolidation in that industry and a continued consolidation really is the natural, um, natural play that we have seen in many other industries as well. And I think... Um, Third and probably last point, um, almost more important, we are we're very proud to be backing um, Silke here, our CEO, um, as, as the CEO of the company. Um, she brings more than 20 years of experience in the industry, and she has really been there, done that. Um, and as I mentioned in the uh, introduction, Mayfair is really focused on backing the very best management teams, and we're very excited to be backing uh, Silke and her team in this journey. So in the end, it is um, management um, for us as a financial investor uh, that is who is driving and developing the company. Thank you. And I'd like just to take a few notes about, uh, about what you just said. One, fundamentals. If you're willing to invest at the moment, the fundamentals, growing, uh, profitability and expectations uh, for Sorry. growth in the future, Sorry, be in the yeah. base. I an amazing team, the possibility to go to keep growing uh, global and technology that is unique and brings a lot of value. Laszlo, you worked in, you were involved in the product due diligence. Tell us a little bit about this process and where were the key factors that you considered during the due diligence process? Value the I, I think um, um, Marcus will um, probably agree that it was a very successful uh, due diligence project because what we came in to do is to provide a, um, a third party independent view, uh, bringing our language um, industry um, and language technology um, expertise into the equation. Essentially, what we signed up to do was help 
um, Marcus and Mayfair make the right decision. And the key questions to, to consider were, well, okay, uh, there's a, a technology platform that, that Yonkers has, um, and Yonkers uh, within the industry has a certain position, and the industry has a certain growth rate. Is this platform uh, that they have going to help them grow scalably? Is this connected to productivity? Is this somewhat unique? Is this marketable? And we came into, um, well, it was quite a few months of work with a lot of interviews and uh, in-depth demos. Um, and we actually even had an on an on-site visit and we got to talk to project managers. We even got to talk to some of the clients of Yonkers um, to evaluate how satisfied and happy they are currently uh, with the tool, having a, a, a clarity on the roadmap and the future developments, which looked also pretty decent. Um, but of course, with the acquisition come uh, many changes in how to prioritize um, development of a, of a product and technology connected to the service. And um, I think that the key notion that we could bring in was, sure, you can do technology due diligence from uh, third-party independent companies. You can do commercial due diligence to a certain degree um, with um, somebody who has a, a clarity and understanding of sales and market and total available market and, and market dynamics. But you really need an industry expert to be able to guide you on a journey for an investment um, into an industry that you haven't been um, privy to so far. And I think Marcus again will probably confirm that, you know, if a, a newcomer to the language industry will find plenty of strange things here that you will not find in any other industry. And you would argue this is a services industry. Um, I would certainly. Um, technology supporting, of course, um, and it's um, it's an industry which is pretty much impervious to crisis. If there's crisis, there's probably even more demand for communication and, and translation and yes. so um, But it does have the, 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 the potential for growth in almost any um, economic environment. But what we uh, came in to do, um, um, it was actually a three, four member team who helped um, Mayfair here is to provide that independent um, unbiased view of what are the key strengths and weaknesses, um, as well as opportunities and threats. Basically, we created a very long, in-depth SWOT analysis for the tool, um, as well as with uh, dozens and dozens of pages of industry insights on the dynamics, um, as well as benchmarking in comparison with different actors um, and technologies um, um, in the language industry space. And um, it was a very interesting project in many ways because what uh, Yonkers has been building is in many ways unique um, and in many ways supportive of the growth that uh, Marcus and the Mayfair team are uh, basically aligning um, the company for. And I guess one of the key findings that we brought to the table was, yes, um, Yonkers uh, with a uh, solid roadmap and the current stage of development of the platform is very much in the mode of scalability and, and um, um, is very much capable of also, if it comes to that, to support both organic and inorganic growth um, of the company and, and growth of revenues at a hopefully stable margin, uh, which is, I guess, the prime concern. And Marcos, you will probably um, talk about that too at some point of time. But um, what we also saw that, yeah, though there are some unique things in the tool, there is an AI component to it, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and we know that right in the middle of the project, all this large language model thing just popped onto everybody's screen, right? So we actually also helped, um, of course, um, Mayfair, as well as um, the other partners in the due diligence process to bring uh, key insights into what is this new technology? Um, what does big tech uh, have to do with this whole thing? Um, is this close to what machine translation has been doing? essentially fueling the growth of the industry? Is it creating new markets or is it going to destroy some of it? Uh, is it going to eat, eat up some of the pie that uh, young cars may be looking at? And our insights were hopefully very useful um, to the degree that, you know, Marcus and Mayfair said, yeah, this is a good idea to invest into. That is amazing. This is very useful information. I know that there are LSPs here with us that would like to find investors uh, and all this information is crucial for them. We know that the due diligence process is an extensive review where the uh, different aspects of a company are evaluated. There's technology due diligence, commercial due diligence, legal due, due, due diligence. In this case, NIMSI participated in the product due diligence. 
And this is my moment to confirm that what Laszlo just said, it is, is true. Marcus, what was the value of partnering with a language expert like Mimsy on this deal? You're on mute. Happy to confirm that it was actually incredibly useful and immensely valuable. So all that uh, Laszlo is, as I said, is actually absolutely hold, hold true. Um, the due diligence exercise that, that private equity typically undertakes is quite involved, um, can spend months, span months. Um, we work with specialist commercial consultants. Um, they're very much focused on understanding the market, the consumers or clients rather, and, and the competitive environment, how do companies differentiate sort of from an outside in perspective almost. Um, and then we also work uh, with technology due diligence providers. So really looking under the hood, uh, understanding software development life cycles, understanding IT infrastructure, cybersecurity, and all, all those sorts of things. But between the two really lies the, the commercial product market fit of the, the technology platform, which is really hard to get to when you are not necessarily looking at a software product, but when you're actually looking at a tech enabled services provider. And that's really that kind of understanding that um, we couldn't get from either one and where Winimsy really more than just built a bridge between the two and actually got us from a hypothesis that uh, Yonkers may have something quite special there in in the technology to to the real conviction that it was indeed um, sort of unique, differentiated, sustainably so because of the technology and the business model around it, um, and and equally importantly, um, scalable as well as applicable to a broader set of the market, um, such that yeah, I think we we were. Uh, we, we gained conviction that actually we could help Yonkers grow to serve more clients better um, on the back of that technology. And that's, that's what we thought was very exciting. Um, AI is a part of that solution and already um, with LLMs on, LLMs on everybody's mind now, um, we are starting to explore how that can really also further benefit um, Yonkers clients by be, becoming part of that or play, by playing a bigger part in the next version of, of, of the solution as it grows and develops. So um, thank hugely, hugely helpful contribution. Couldn't have thank you, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Marcus. And Marcus just said and introduced us to the next question that I'm going to ask. And I would like to start with Laszlo. You also already talked a little bit about it. How do you foresee the future for, for the language industry in this scenario where everyone, again, because this happened with machine translation and Google Translate, where everyone was like, okay, this okay. is done, this is going to be super disruptive, it's going to change the market forever. How do you see the future of the language industry in the current scenario? A very good question, Angelica. And I guess I'll lead in, and, and Marcus, you can also add your, your uh, part to it as to how you see it now, um, essentially owning a, a language service provider. but. What we see and what we predict is, yes, uh, large language models and AI are disruptive in many ways, uh, yeah. uh, but the core of the language services industry has not changed, which is essentially what buyers are paying for are words, maybe hours, but what they're really getting um, as value is, is the project man management. It's eliminating or reducing the complexity of getting to new markets, accessing new customers. Um, as well as, of course, everything that is related to the supply chain. Um, as Renato in his uh, book, Together with Tucker, they described these are kind of two of the three main value creation points for language service providers in the first place. Which is to say, even in the new world of AI and large language models, ultimately human in the loop is still the, the ruling paradigm. It will not go away. Um, there are of course, attempts to say, hey, but maybe AI can revise and review and correct and adjust AI. Sure. At the same time, if you're looking at mission critical content, then you will certainly want to have somebody that you trust as an expert uh, to say, is this actually the right content? Is this the right output? Because it doesn't really matter how content, multilingual content gets created. Is it translated from a source? Um, is it transcreated? 
is it created in the local language or is it um, multilingual created by a large language model? What really is important is how that content actually gets to the customer or of the channels of that. Does it create engagement? Does it create new sales? Um, and does it increase brand awareness? Uh, does it help win uh, new markets um, and um, new sales? Um, so ultimately, as long as those paradigms are, are still alive and they very much are so, um, our prediction is the language industry will essentially assimilate large language models and, and machine learning in, in general more and more into their uh, toolbox. Um, and it will probably only help the industry to grow. Essentially, it's kind of similar as to what how machine translation helped the industry. Machine translation just didn't really replace translators. Uh, they helped them become more productive, right? At the same time, uh, machine translation also as we like saying it, machine to MP is the alternative of NP, which is no translation. Machine translation doesn't really replace translation as such, it replaces no translation. It allowed the translation of content that otherwise would have been too expensive to translate in the first place. It's kind of similar with large language models. Now there's a whole bunch of content that will be created, which otherwise would have been way too expensive to create. But in the multilingual context, those still need to be vetted um validated or even curated for the specific markets for the specific audiences uh, for the specific brands and for the products um so what we see is that the language industry with the help of these tools will probably grow just as well if not more than previously uh, these tools are enablers um, they will essentially support um, language providers language service providers to be maybe more productive uh, find new services um, or offering new services, uh, more complex, or hopefully sometimes more simple solutions to their customers and clients. Um, and the key question that we sometimes ask is, uh, yes, yes, but some of these tools actually can do things that not just language service uh, providers could do, but you know, other tech providers could also jump on this. Sure, uh, but there's one key distinguishing factor that language service providers have that other tech providers don't. So as long as Somebody can create a multilingual content generation tool based on whatever it may be, ChatGPT or GPT-4 or Google's models or Bloom, whichever large language model it is. You still need to have the supply chain, which language service providers have. Yonkers also, right? Um, this is one of the key differentiators that the language services industry has amassed over the years, which is how do we find the language talent, not necessarily translators, not necessarily linguists, how do we find the language talent that, that who can do the cultural ad adaptation advisory, um, the subject matter expertise input and validation that is so critical for those kind of content, which actually are essentially mission critical to um, to language services buyers. Marcus, is that like, something similar that you see at, at uh, Yonkers, the conversations that you're having? Yes, and I just want to add something yeah. before asking Marcus, as a, yeah. now Mayfair uh, is part of uh, the industry, uh, but something that you said what? is there's going to be a yeah. huge creation of content. Every like Creating content at the moment has become easy. You just choose the right prompt and put it into ChatGPT, and it creates you a book. Uh, for the calendar for your for of content to comp uh, to share yeah. from your company, but the expertise, yeah. the management yeah. of the project is where the value is still lies, and we yeah. know this for the quite a while. Right. Now, Marcus, now you are part of this industry. Mayfair is a owner of a language provider. What do you think about this? Where do you think the the the, the future is going? I, I actually very much agree with uh, Laszlo and the overall notion that I think there's a lot more opportunity. <laughs> I'll just battle it out. Um, there's a lot more opportunity in uh, in this than, than than I think is generally sort of um, real recognized in the investor community um, to some extent because again, the, as I mentioned before, the industry has been through so many disruptions. Um, I think. Large language models, generally generative AI, um, plays probably a role in three different levels in, in the industry. One is really on the translation side, and it doesn't actually play as much of a role there. I think if you so sort of, if you sound out the market, it is still very much around neural machine translations being better and better attuned for uh, for translation jobs. Now that may change, but it is not going to fundamentally change the 
the need for post-editing, the need for the human or the expert in the loop um, at all. So actually, I think the impact at that level is going to be relatively limited. Um, I think the bigger opportunity is really in driving efficiency and driving productivity uh, exactly around just the pure translation task, the, the workflows, yeah. um, the quality assurance to some extent, although the, the expert in the loop will probably remain yeah, for quite a while, yeah, and then also managing the, um, yeah. the integration and the well, the, the, the actually the complexity yeah. of the workflow with uh, large enterprise clients, which is where I think simplifying the AI can also play play a big role. Uh, nonetheless, I think the service component, um, because in the end you are an outsourcing yeah. provider to large enterprises for something that actually is mission critical to them, but represents a slight, a relatively low cost item. So that service component right. will remain incredibly important because yeah. you can't get it wrong. It is all about the brand, no, the brand equity that you can deploy in an instant if um, a translation isn't quite, or is quite off point um, uh, in, in that context. And the third one, that's probably the, the, the really exciting piece is the new business models that generative AI and, and large language models really enabled. Um, areas that probably that, that langu um, language service providers haven't really been looking into, um, sort of uh, transcreated or rather rather locally generated content post edited at scale um, can be used in many, many different businesses rather than just um, sort of in a in a um, in the translation context. And I think there are a lot of opportunities out there. It's probably still early days, um, but it's something that's definitely worth worthwhile exploring to see where um, companies with supply chains like language service providers um, have them um, can be usefully usefully deployed. Thank you very much. There are there's a lot of value. And what yeah. uh, what would you say to another firm, another investor? investor that is looking to enter the language industry, what would be your recommendation? Um, yeah, hey, I think there is Mayfair's business. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's many different angles that you can take as an, as an investor. Um, and depending on the angle you take, what you look for um, would, would differ quite widely. If you're looking for a technology play, then you should really make sure that your addressable market is large enough um, and I'd be very careful when you are sort of veering into a space where you're trying to replace a service solution with a technology solution um, where essentially the service will still be required in particular at an enterprise level and then very often um, you may realize that the, the addressable market for some of the technology solutions is actually whilst they're exciting products that really help the industry um, there may actually not be that many clients out there uh, so I think that that's an important one to understand. Um, if you're looking at, at LSPs, um, I think a little differentiation can, can go a long way. Um, if that differentiation proves sustainable um, and you combine that with a company that is scalable and has growth momentum, um, then I think your chances to exit, which is also important for uh, financial sponsors in a consolidated market, um, are actually pretty good. So. If you're looking to invest in LSPs, I'd be looking exactly at that. Uh, some sustainable differentiation, a focus on a particular niche, a particular technology, um, and all of that in the context of a company that is really has really demonstrated that, that organic growth momentum that comes with it. Thank you. And what would you recommend to an LSP that is looking to be acquired or looking for new investors? So I would like to talk about that, that silver bullet technology solution that uh, I think we found with Yonkers, but it doesn't actually exist that often. And it really doesn't just have to be that. Um, and I think uh, sort of many LSPs have come to market with technology that hasn't actually quite stood up to the, uh, to the test of Laszlo and, and his colleagues. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say it's exactly that as investors have become somewhat skeptical. Um, I think a, actually a streamlined operating model, a very light footprint um, with demonstrable organic growth momentum, as I've just mentioned. Um, and that requires very, very solid commercial execution because it's not terribly easy in the, in the industry. That is almost already a battle, a battle half one, I'd say. Um, a little differentiation goes a long way in uh, service industries, I'd say. Thank you. Big questions. Are you looking to invest in, again in the language industry? So we're very excited by Yonkers as the platform that we are backing. And um, we think we are very much certain that it is 
a the right platform for a consolidation play in the industry so we're very much looking to double down and um yeah help yonkers really fulfill the potential of um of the tech platform that they have so and really part of that story is really just bringing more clients and um, potentially also inorganically therefore mm -hmm. more other smaller lsps onto that platform yeah. so the answer so is very, very much resounding yes that is amazing the last look what would uh, your recommendations be for an lsp that is looking to get acquired after participating in this due diligence process you're on mute i generally will unmute myself and agree with you <laughs> uh which is this is a services industry which means what the clients are looking for is um an ease of mind and, and a peace of mind so um, any LSP that wants to grow and find investors needs to demonstrate that this is already happening. There are typical hurdle, hurdles to growth. And one of them is when um, uh, an LSP on the growth curve finds their first large enterprise client, right? That's really challenging because you, you need to focus a lot of your um, company's energy to satisfy that single client, which may require bespoke solutions, uh, processes, people, and technology as well. And the next hurdle comes when uh, the solutions that have been created for the first one, two, three enterprise clients suddenly need to become scalable. Um, you need to find out how can you support growth for a large number of clients, mid-size or large enterprise. And um, I guess this is something that, that Yonkers actually figured out in the background um, without going too much into the market to say. There are various ways of doing this. Um, you can create best book solutions as well as you can uh, create a um, highly productive and scalable platform underneath it. And I think that's something that is really um, important when it comes to technology that clients don't necessarily buy into the shiny new tech. They buy into the services and the solutions that the technology and the people will provide together. And it also goes back um, in, the, in the same sense to large language models. It's so really, really easy to start with, really easy to overcommit, really hard to put into operations. But typically language services buyers are, especially the enterprise clients, um, they, are, uh, they usually stick with their language service providers as long as they get the service that they actually need. So the ability to continuously demonstrate that, um, that um, an LSP can meet the requirements of enterprise clients is the number one stepping stone into growth and finding investors. Technology, we can buy it externally. Um, you can buy into Microsoft and OpenAI for large language models if you want to. You don't need to do anything um, reinventing the wheel. Um, but um, Yonkers' example, for example, showed that, um, yeah, if you're just looking to streamline your own operations and um, create um, a better service uh, for your clients through that, can actually yield a technology platform that will enable your growth for multiple clients at the same time. Um, and even integrating um, potentially you know, um, new mergers and acquisitions um, onto the platform as well. And um, that, if uh, Yonkers has been able to demonstrate um, you know, how their clients stick with them, even through a technology change, that ability is, is one that is really important for, for investors. So if you're an LSP and you're looking to sell, the first thing you need to demonstrate is you can keep your clients. And next thing you need to demonstrate is you can win new logos. Um, and technology will not do that. Management, certainly, the management experience. You do need a lot of sales, clearly, uh, to do that. But ultimately, what matters is that you provide the service uh, that the clients need. You have the supply chain, uh, your large language talent pool, uh, to be able to support the, the deliveries to your clients, as well as, yes, if there are technology disruptions, you have the um, agility to be able to adopt, um, adapt those um, into your workflows um, and demonstrate that you can bring additional value and create additional value to your clients with these new technologies as well. Thank you. We are nearing the end of the event. Laszlo, is there something that you would like to ask Marcos before we start closing the event? Um, yes, I wanted to ask, of course. Um, we helped you and, and, and the Mayfair team upskill you in the um, in a little bit in the localization industry, the language services industry and, and in this business. Um, do you believe that you are the right investors for LSPs and why so? If somebody was selling, why should they go to you? 
We, I think we, we pride ourselves on being good partners to the best management teams. And as a firm, we put a lot of thought into how we can actually be the right and the best partners. And um, we've, we've come to the conclusion that um, besides just being thoughtful and present, we actually have built a team of specialists which is sort of a portfolio team, if you will, but of a very different nature. So we've built a team of specialists who really know um, what they are doing in the sense that they have very, very deep functional expertise. They have spent their entire life, uh, example of one person in the digital, um, digital marketing world. Um, another one of our specialists has spent most of their life in the B2B sales environment. Another one used to be the chief digital officer of Tesco's and Deutsche Bank, for example. So very high profile senior, former executives with real jobs that can actually um, okay. essentially as free resources to our portfolio so, teams, really help grow and scale and uh, yeah. avoid making mistakes, um, share learnings from their lives and uh, give some free advice, but also roll up their sleeves and really help do and help help transform um, the companies in the direction that, that management would like the company to change. Um, so I think we are, very active and very helpful. Um, and I think we're doing that across all of our investments. Uh, and I think we have tried our best to learn the ropes in the language services industry, which I think we've done with, with your help as well, such that we can um, be relevant partners with industry knowledge and functional expertise. So I think that's, um, if you ask me, a winning combination. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. That, thank you for saying that, actually, because I, I was going to say that, um, you know, I, I personally even got to meet with your, your specialist team members, say hello to them, of course, um, and they're amazing um, experts um, in their field, and it was a pleasure to be working with them, and we look forward to uh, supporting you further on the journey with Yonkers and getting growth. Likewise. Thank you very much for being a part of it. Absolutely. I, oh, okay, fine. Thank you, gentlemen. We are nearing the end of the event. I want to thank Marcos Sederman okay. for joining us. Thank you, Marcos. We hope to see you again, and we hope that you keep being yeah. part and growing your language industry assets. And, and thank you, Laszlo, for joining us again. I'm sure we're going to be seeing your face a, a lot now that everyone wants to talk about AI and large language um, models. And to everyone, please don't forget to visit the Investor Landing page from Minsi, where you can find how Minsi can help you from the evaluation stage to the acquisition stage with all the services that we can provide. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I hope to see you again. Thank you, Angelica. Angelica, thanks for every um, attendee. And thank you, Marcus, for joining. I love you. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank you.